Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. We gathered together tonight to discuss a major survey carried out by the Alcohol and Crime Commission, which was set up by Adaction, consisting of leading figures from across the prison system, from Parliament and the treatment sector. The Commission surveyed prisoners across England and found that while many will be able to manage their alcohol problems during their sentence, a lack of support upon being released can lead them straight back into criminal behaviour. So how do we break that cycle? Talking about alcohol, I'm going to start by... Psychoactive substances, as they're called. We, we have a, a very odd relationship with psychoactive substances, and that might be for health or recreation. And as a species, we've, we've experimented with and we've often become addicted to a whole range of substances, depending upon where on the planet we lived and, and, and what was available. And for, for most of uh, man, woman's history, there's nothing been much around in the way of laws. It was more about culture rather than laws and morals. It was also about profit. But it was in the 20th century when things got, got complicated and, and countries, uh, notably the USA, began to decide that actually some things were legal and some things were illegal. And some of the motives in that legal, illegal debate were more about race and social engineering and, and less, I would say, about, about harm. Prohibition we had, that was probably as, as hypocritical as was the development of new psychoactive substances to keep troops fighting or uh, acceptance of existing substances to offset battle trauma, places like Vietnam. So today we're left with a random selection of substances that are illegal and others that are not only legal, but in many communities they're socially lauded, alcohol being, being our favourite. Now, in terms of what all these substances do to us, the debate remains inconsistent. And legal substances like alcohol and tobacco, we know, kill more people than heroin, cannabis, and cocaine. With alcohol, we talk about units of consumption, and we talk about sensible drinking, whatever that is. But we do know, but we're fairly reluctant to admit, that if alcohol was invented tomorrow in a remote Chinese laboratory, as many substances currently are, it would immediately be banned. There would be no doubt about it whatsoever. And the debates about relative harms are important. Um, not always welcomed, as Professor David Nutt uh, has found to his cost. And Debates around legalization and decriminalization, they're important as well. And unit pricing, that warrants discussion too. But that's not what we're here to talk about tonight. What's missing is a real debate about behavior. And that's what this report is trying to open up. Interestingly, many public figures, if you push them, will admit to smoking cannabis, um, although it's very odd how many of them didn't inhale or how many of them only did it once, but, you know, we take them on their word. They probably sat around in a dark room listening to bad music, talking nonsense, and if that resonates to some of you here, well, so be it. Heroin, well, it may enhance your feelings and emotions, but it will do so while you are to the rest of the world in a stupor. Cocaine, crystal meth, well, that's very often about sexual behaviour, uh, but I'll leave that one with you. But it's the acquisition of these illicit substances, that's the bit that necessitates the criminal behavior, the acquisition. The behaviors, the behaviors under the influence of these substances, not good for you, not socially acceptable, but it's more about personal problems rather than public problems. Alcohol, well, then we're into a major paradigm shift. Now, when I try to get more than one pack of paracetamol after a hard day's gardening, the checkout staff, they're very apologetic, but they'll only let me have one pack because it's very, very dangerous stuff. Mm. But I can go and buy a case of vodka and a bottle of vodka will kill me, but much less than a bottle of vodka will significantly affect my behavior. I can't drive a car, I can pass legislation. Um, might want to raise that with the minister. 
what sort of other things people do under the influence of alcohol, we are more reluctant to investigate. And I think that's primarily because of its legality. And alcohol affects different people in different ways. And we need to, be, we need to do more to understand and, and tackle those behaviours. Now, our report outlines a lot of data on alcohol and crime and not least on domestic violence. It also highlights how little we're doing about it. Now, in prison, we deal to a certain extent with alcohol dependence, but we should be aware that people can behave badly under the influence of alcohol without being dependent. Dependency might not be the primary issue. And prisoners, okay, you can get drugs in jail, um, but largely prisoners are abstinent from alcohol in jail. Um, you can get it to a certain extent, people brew it, um, open prisons, you can get hold of it, but largely it's not there in the same way that the traditional illicit, illicit drug, drugs are. Um, and that tends to lead us to a false sense of security, i.e. it isn't a problem because no one's taking it. But what prison is and should be, in my opinion, is an opportunity to intervene and really make a difference. Prisoners we interview, they, they told us, one in particular said, well, uh, have you got an alcohol problem? Mm, no, but I'm usually drunk when I'm arrested. Now, a lot of money has been and continues to be spent, quite rightly, on traditional drug treatment. But alcohol treatment remains beyond detox, beyond that initial problematic uh, issue, what I would describe as the Cinderella service. And what we need to do, and we've highlighted in the report, as a social scientist, I would say we do need more research uh, about that, that relationship between alcohol and offending behavior. Because what we should do is, in this new world of the CRCs, the community rehabilitation companies, we need to commission more alcohol-specific services. We need to commission services based on the needs of prisoners, based on the problems that they have and that they tell us about, not that we think they have or they, we think they should have. And we desperately need women-specific alcohol services. So this report is not a plea for more resources, and that was, that was for, the, for the politicians, primarily because the, I know, I'm not naive, there are no more resources. What it's a plea for are better targeted resources within existing expenditure. Not all alcohol-related crime is obvious or detected, but within that, lives continue to be ruined. So what I would say, above all, we need to wake up and smell the ethanol. I'd just like us to consider the last couple of years, maybe. So um, a few years ago, I met a young man. Let's, let's call him Danny. Danny was in his late 20s, and after two spells in prison, the latter an extended period, he was receiving support from Adaction's prison resettlement service in the Northwest. When I spoke to Danny, he um, readily admitted that prison sentence was an inevitable consequence of his chaotic lifestyle. In his teens, he had developed a serious problem with drugs, which caused immense difficulties for him and his family and the local community. But moreover, it masked a significant problem he had with alcohol. Danny received help for his drug problem during prison, and that's great, and we see a lot of that, but not for his drinking. So when he left after his first sentence, with no access to resettlement services, alcohol filled a void. The gains that Danny had made in his recovery from drugs were lost, and he once again became estranged from his family. Sadly, his story is not unusual. In 2010, the HMIP identified that 60% of those entering prison with an alcohol problem would leave with that problem ongoing and unaddressed. So, for Danny, a second and longer spell in prison followed. That's when he came into contact with Adaction's Resettlement Service, a service committed to working with Danny inside prison, alongside prison workers, and preparing him for his release. This time, Danny would be met at the prison gate, he would be found accommodation, linked into community alcohol services, and given support on the outside to regain control of his life. And Danny has done just that. He's overcome his problematic relationship with alcohol. Again, he's reunited with his family. And at the time I met Danny, 
he was undergoing training to strengthen his employability, something that he'd struggled with for many years. Now, in our report, we point to the extent of the problem. In our survey with prisoners, which is a, a unique opportunity, 70% of the respondents, these are prisoners themselves, acknowledged that they'd been drinking when they committed the crime for which they were convicted. Now, this is a really important point. In all likelihood, a good proportion of that 70% were not dependent drinkers. In that sense, they were not addicted. But that's not to say that their relationship with alcohol was not problematic, harmful, or hazardous. In fact, for many, that relationship with alcohol is the very closely associated with their offending. The reality is that for those prisoners, it's highly unlikely that they will get the help and support they need for their problematic relationship with alcohol. We know, too, that the HMIP identified that 44% of violent crime victims believed the offender to be under the influence when they committed the crime. Reoffending rates continue to be high, yet criminal justice does little to identify, assess and support prisoners with a harmful relationship with alcohol. That's why this commission recommends that alcohol awareness training should be provided for offender managers, peer support workers and mentors. Why? This would ensure that prisoners are being asked about their relationship with alcohol, whether or not it's a dependent one. And that's key to addressing this challenge. Add to this a targeted service that helps those prisoners with a problematic relationship with alcohol, and we may be able to address the negative patterns of behaviour on release. The Commission identified that these through-the-gate services linking prison support with life in the community are vital to rehabilitation, to their recovery, and integral to reducing reoffending rates, which is what the government is really concerned about. Yet, surprisingly, the designated adaction resettlement service in the Northwest no longer exists. It's been subsumed into a restructure of drug and alcohol services, and as a consequence, there is no guarantee that prisoners with alcohol problems will get the joined up through the gate approach that they once had on release. It's vital, too, that the commissioning landscape for alcohol treatment services recognise the opportunity that presents itself during a prison sentence and on release. The best service arrangements make reference to these ex expectations and will have dedicated alcohol treatment services, but that's not always the case. And the Commission rightly identifies that interventions should be more tailored toward alcohol misuse and that alcohol referral schemes should be set up as part of all resettlement programmes. Finally, and as a precursor to a greater chance of successful outcomes for alcohol-dependent and problematic drinkers in prison, we've suggested that we don't simply rely on existing data, as John's alluded to. A thorough and specific needs analysis should be carried out into alcohol misuse among the prison population. This will give us an opportunity to understand the true extent of the problem and inform how we target resources, and it's critical that we fully engage the prison population in that process. Now, I'm delighted that Adaction, through its resettlement service, helped and supported many prisoners like Danny to beat their addiction, leave their criminal behaviour behind and find a way to make a positive contribution in the community. With a greater focus on resettlement in prisons and the up-and-coming Transforming Rehabilitation programme, we have a chance to make this the norm, not the exception. The High Sheriff is the oldest non-secular office in the country, dating back to 700. It's an appointment made by the Queen, on recommendation of the Privy Council. It's a great honour for me to uh, be appointed High Sheriff of Greater London, which effectively means I am the Queen's representative to the criminal justice world, which is prisons, police, and the judiciary. Um, my role as High Sheriff, or my appointment as High Sheriff, I'd like to believe is a consequence of a fairly long-term interest in criminal justice, particularly the, the for me, about rehabilitation, about breaking the cycle. Uh, I've been involved in a commission looking into English prison systems, which included visits to prisons overseas. Uh, I've also been involved as a founder, co-founder of the Clink uh, Prison Restaurant Charity, which is a high-class fine dining training restaurant located inside the walls of a prison. We have three uh, restaurants, one at High Down in Sutton, one at uh, Cardiff, and one at Brixton, which you're all more than welcome to visit. 
The, pro the point of the clink is that if we uh, provide uh, inmates with rehabilitation, with training, with workplace experience and education, help them into work and some mentoring, then there's an immediate and dramatic effect in reducing reoffending rates. My interest in alcohol is, is very personal. My mother was an alcoholic, my father was an alcoholic, my brother was probably an alcoholic. So I have huge personal experience growing up as a young man in that kind of alcoholic and, and mad environment. I've always been amazed about the amount of uh, public uh, response about the level of funding, the amounts of awareness, the amounts of commitment and drive and po politicians' time that's given to drugs and how little is actually given to alcohol uh, services and help to uh, reform alcoholics. And I have personal experience of this and I can tell you how bad the system is. In terms of um, what I've seen, I've seen how alcohol can da damage families. I've seen how alcohol, what it can do to an individual and I've seen what alcohol can do to society. And it was a combination of my personal experience with alcohol and my knowledge and long-term experience with criminal justice that when John asked me to join the, the commission uh, looking into alcohol in the criminal justice system, I was delighted to join and hopefully give the benefit of some personal experience and knowledge. Uh, I, I'm passionately committed to breaking the cycle of reoffending and I think a massive part of that reoffending process is alcohol related. I don't think there's any doubt in, in my mind in that, and I don't think, I think the report clearly indicates that. I'm particularly interested in family support. My question is about what else can we do to make sure that the people who, are, who love that person and who can support that person within a family context can be brought into this as well? I think it's, 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 it's dreadful when someone in your family is an alcoholic. It's, it's an absolute nightmare. Because all you want to do as a family and as a group is help and support them. And all they end up doing is letting you down. And, and it's dreadful. I, ultimately, an alcoholic has to decide himself. And what the family needs to be is when that person decides, they need to be and give them support. Now, to get there, you have to forgive dozens, hundreds of times. Now, in a relation to uh, you know, an inmate, a prisoner, lots of inmates don't have that family. That kind of connection in prisons is, is fractured and broken anyway. So I think what we've got to try and do is build up networks of support around people on release or through the gate who have an alcohol issue so that even though they fail and they stumble, there's still a group around them to help them pick them up until the day comes. And they're always an alcoholic, by the way. They never stop being alcoholic. But maybe the alcoholic stops drinking. And that's a lot of the work, clearly, that Simon does and his his program and his group. So it's that support network. And it's absent a lot in prisons. So we've got to somehow put that mechanism in place to put that around them and, and pick them up when they fall. Patrick Foster from Wormwood Scrubs Community Chaplaincy. <clears throat> I'd like to just throw the, a few words that you've said and put them all together in some sort of question, which is remand, uh, through the gates, mentoring, and also TR. How would you like to see the TR process evolve, we've been saying for years that remand is, should not be separated. And thirdly, uh, young offenders, young adults, 21 to 18 year olds are now being sent to the scrubs because they aren't going to Feltham. They're on remand, the whole lot of them. We're introducing a program which will deal with their particular problem. Can you give us some idea of <laughs> those amazingly big questions in the next two minutes? TR. Um, I wouldn't start from here or, or, or indeed where, where are we going? And I make my position clear, I wouldn't have dismantled the probation service, but we, we, are, we are where we are. I, th I think we, we had to, it's almost going back to basics. I mean, I mean, one of the big issues that's kind of implicit in everything you're saying is the capacity of the, of the system. You know, we talk about resources. We, we've got to be, we've got to start by imprisoning fewer. We can't lock up more and more people and spend less and less money, which is, which is what we're doing. And that's what, uh, you know, we have to accept that at the back of TR is, is a, is a cost-cutting exercise. Um, I mean, if Jeremy Wright was here, I mean, I'm sure he would laud the fact that all short-term prisoners, people serving under 12 months, are now going to get supervision. Well, there are no extra resources for that. The people who were doing the supervision in the past are now got another 80,000 prisoners to supervise. I, I don't get, I can't do the math. I'm, I, I'm, I'm sorry on that. Um, 
But we've got to start locking up people that we're, we're scared of rather than that we're mad at. You know, OK, people have done things that are wrong. Um, we want punishment. We want deterrence and retribution. Um, and I was involved in a programme yesterday on Radio 4, Disabled Behind Bars, mm. and how we de deal with disabled people. Um, well, they've done something wrong and they need to be punished. Yeah, OK, well, you know, if you want to deprive someone in a wheelchair of their liberty, it's not, it's not difficult. It doesn't need Wormwood Scrubs. It doesn't need, doesn't need Wandsworth. Um, OK, whatever you think of Vicky Price and Chris Hewn and, and, and the guy that sabotaged the, the Oxford boat race. Um, OK, we were mad at them. Um, did they need prison? Were there other more constructive ways of dealing with them? And, and that's where you save money. Uh, you know, and I accept that all public services need to save money. You know, and I, I said that this report was not a plea for more resources. It was a plea for better targeted resources. Everything about cost and dealing with women and all the problems of drugs and alcohol would have cost an awful lot less. It would have taken a little bit of political courage. Um, but that, that's absent. And, and, and unfortunately, you know, as we run up to an election, and we're seeing it already, and I'd say it if Jeremy Wright was here or if Sadiq Khan was here, you know, let's, you know, the word tough, um, well, you know, there, there are ways of being tough, but there are ways of, of, of wasting money. But I, I think we need to, in the criminal justice system, start using the prison system for, for the people who, who, who really need it, and, and we need much more in the way of diversion, and that's particularly true around drugs and alcohol.